Our next speaker is Pranesh Prakash. Um, he is the policy director of the Center for Internet and Society. Thanks, Krista. Uh, so I'll just quickly uh, run through as many points uh, that I can uh, over the next three minutes. Uh, so. One, on the issue of commercial availability, I don't really have much to add beyond what Marianne has already said, uh, but I'll just set up a thought experiment for you. Imagine uh, if someone said that if a book is commercially available, you are not allowed to take it out from a library. Now that would be an unacceptable limitation. But that is more or less what is being put into the treaty right now if we have limitations on commercial availability. Okay, and uh, while dealing with the issue of commercial availability in Article D, which allows for cro cross-border transfers, we have to ensure that the limitations on uh, commercial availability in Article C don't actually hamper the ability of, uh, of well-funded uh, authorized entities uh, or uh, people who are engaging in, uh, in conversion of books in uh, richer countries from serving those in poorer countries. Uh, quickly on the issue of individual downloads which are, or individual access, uh, which is being uh, talked about in Article E. Now, it is imperative for the success of this treaty uh, that individuals have the right to access uh, for all the reasons that, that Marianne already gave. Uh, Marianne, you've made my job very tough now, okay, uh, but uh, there is talk right now going on uh, or there is a possibility of uh, some kind of liability related system being put on uh, on authorized entities uh, for these individual, uh, for uh, in cases where individuals download and then violate copyright law themselves. I think this is a very bad idea. Uh, in fact, if we are to have this kind of an idea, let's impose it on everyone. Let's impose it on li libraries who serve individuals. Let's impose it on, on companies like YouTube and make them liable for every single copyright violation by all of their users because all of them, in fact, serve copyrighted materials. Why should authorized entities who are dealing with the blind be treated differently and have higher levels of liability than other such organizations who are not necessarily dealing with the blind. It actually, to my, in, I would say it's, it's retrograde. It, it, it makes access that much more difficult. It makes, uh, you know, philanthropic activity in, in, in this area much less likely. And any of the authorized entities are required to be nonprofits according to this treaty. Uh, on TPMs, apart from issues, uh, the kinds of uh, limitations that, that TPMs can put in, in terms of navigability, etc., of, of a book. Uh, they can also put limitations on the devices that you read a book on. Now, in India, right now, we're thinking of, uh, of using a, a fund that the government has uh, to load up books that are uh, legally available onto cheap mobile phones that have a daisy reader on them. Now, this kind of a project wouldn't work, for instance, by, by having uh, accessible books available on the, the uh, you know, Apple iStore, for instance, for download, and being connected to an Apple uh, device. Apple devices are incredibly expensive in India. Okay, it, uh, it, it's uh, more than, uh, it, it's around, for, for a person who earns well, uh, like me, it's around one entire month's salary, okay, and and it's not affordable. And the devices we're thinking of doing these on cost around one sixtieth of what an Apple device costs. And we have to be able to have books available on all platforms, which is a point that was made earlier uh, uh, in the week by Marcus as well. So it's it's not. Uh, negotiable that, that TPMs have to be broken in, in many cases if they put unreasonable restrictions that copyright law itself doesn't allow them to put, which is what TPMs are often used to do. Uh, translations, I would like to highlight, 
are pretty much the same issue as TPMs. TPMs are a kind of digital lock that render the, the inside of it unreadable. Now, a book in a different language is a different kind of digital lock. You still can't read it. Okay, so the issue of access, which is very important, which is what we're trying to get to blind people in this, in this treaty. And just as TPMs are a very important issue in this treaty, I believe translations as well are equally important. And the European Union has asked us, okay, when, uh, when translation is available under other provisions of the law, can be done under other treaties, why not use those provisions? Well, the WCT also allows for TPMs to be, to be uh, broken under uh, circumstances laid down by national laws. But it doesn't require that. It's still, TPMs can still prove a barrier to access. And it's the same thing with translation. Sure, other provisions of law are available, but they are not good enough because most countries don't have them. Okay, and uh, lastly, I'd, I'd just like to end with the point on, on the IP system being undermined. Uh, so, one of the original framers of the Berne Convention, the Swiss jurist Numa Dross, uh, in the closing speech of the uh, 1884 Berne uh, Conference, said that limits to absolute protection are rightly set by the public interest. And this is in 1884. And I'm not sure why we're debating over this very fundamental principle that IP doesn't mean that creators get absolute rights. It's a limited right to further the public interest, and public interest can itself be a limitation on this right. Thanks. Thank you very much, Panish. Um, I think you've brought up a very hot topic for today. Um, it's the first time we've heard this on the panel regarding translations. I was wondering if you could um, respond to some of the comments that, that have been made, not in this room today, but in, a, in some of the, uh, you know, just going around that, um, that you don't need to have the right of translation contained explicitly in this treaty. There are some that believe that it's already covered. So can you respond to that? Uh, sure, it can be seen as already covered uh, uh, in, in multiple ways, either uh, in the main text of the burn or in the burn appendix. Uh, but that is insufficient in my opinion because what we're setting up here is, uh, is trying to have equal access okay, for the blind. Okay, now that cannot happen. Okay, now say uh, someone actually gets a book and does a translation in India under a translation right. That book is still not necessarily accessible. You need an accessible book in a particular language. Okay, not just a book in a particular language. So translation rights are a separate issue from translation rights for the blind. Okay, and the general right, even when it is not provided by national law, okay, should not hamper access by the blind when it comes to uh, when it comes to books, because already they are, you know, far behind. Access. So if the blind had equal access, sure, I would not be asking for a separate translation right for them. Okay. The blind in India, okay, which has the world's largest population of, of persons with print disabilities, have access to less than 1% of the books that sighted people elsewhere have access to, sighted people like me have access to. And I think that is just not acceptable. Thank you. I'd like to make a point that, that a country like Japan, for instance, has a right of translation specifically for blind people in its law. Uh, and other countries, as Marcus pointed out, uh, many other countries across the developing world are dependent on other languages. Okay, the elite in, ma in many countries are dependent on other languages, whereas other people in those countries are, uh, can't have access to the same text, including you know, many of, of the blind people can't have access to those same texts because they don't speak that language, they don't read that language. Okay. And this is historically because of colonialism. Okay, so to now, okay, to say that okay, fine, uh, we want to allow access to text, but not access to text in a language that 
the majority of the blind people who generally are disadvantaged uh, educationally, okay, most blind people in India don't even uh, cross the fifth grade. Okay, now in that kind of a situation, okay, to say that you need to be able to read English or French, and, and who in India reads French, uh, but uh, to be able to read in those kinds of languages in order to have access to the same text that sighted persons in school have access to, okay, I don't think is fair. Uh, I think whether it is characterized as, as affirmative action or not, I think it is a crucial part of equality that it is not asking for something being more than equal for blind people. So I, I, I mean, you kind of sorry, you're just pressing my buttons here because I, mean, I, I, I take it you you are multilingual as well, um, speaking more than one language. And I mean, to me, to translate a work is like like going to uh, somebody who painted the painting. Say, well, I she sh he should have painted the nose not that way but the other way, and changing, you know, just changing the work without asking. To 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 publishers and authors, that's the kind of button this presses when you say. Who cares about the French publishing in French? Let's just take their stuff and put it up somewhere in English. I really don't get it, that. And uh, this, this, this approach of just saying um, we, we have to be able to, to translate almost you know, per force whatever we want, this kind of... Uh, if I could just quickly respond to yeah, that. Please. I, I agree completely. And if publishers made works available in Hindi, Okay, the predominant language in Tamil, which is another language that I speak. Okay, in other languages, okay, translated quality educational books, for instance, that wouldn't be a problem. Okay, so to say that many blind people from the state that I come from, where English is not widely spoken, okay, I am part of the elite of India because I speak English, I have gone to a good law school and everything. Okay, to say that other people Okay, can't have those rights okay, because they don't speak that language and publishers have not made the, those books available in translations. Okay, that becomes a problem. So, and if you, look at diff, if, if you look at a publisher, at an educational publisher, for instance, like Pratham Books, okay, which makes its books available for translations, their primary books, original language books, tell much more as well. Okay, so there are practical examples of that.